This is episode 262 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Leah in the Gut, with Dr. Marissa Scabuzzo. Hey, everybody, we are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate us and leave a review. We're all always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Marissa Scavuzzo from the Case Western University. She's on the podcast to talk about her research on enteric glia in a healthy gut and how they respond to dietary, environmental, or genetic changes. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news. That's coming right up. But first, late-breaking poster abstracts for ISCR are due April 3rd. A reminder to submit your abstract for ISCR 2024 happening this July 10th to the 13th in Hamburg. We'll be attending and covering the meeting, of course, and we can't wait to see you there. I cannot wait. I just can't wait to be there, Rune. You're gonna, I'm going to be the hamburglar up in there. You need to watch out. <laughs> all right. See if I don't get myself arrested, but I'll try and you got to keep me in line. All right. I'm asking you and the producer of the podcast to keep me on mission because when I get up in Hamburg, no telling, no telling. I haven't been out of the country in too long. Let me get to the roundup. Starting off with a story from a real icon in the field from the beginning, Fred Gage, otherwise known as Rusty Gage. Uh, you know, he really brought the heat early and had some deeply impactful studies. And he's kept going here now, you know, 25 years on in the stem cell field. Uh, he's been into astrocytes. You know, that's his 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 bag, the astrocytes and the most abundant glial cell type. So you can't blame him. And they're also implicated in a lot of neurological disorders, which is probably why what drives his interest. Um, and, and the problem is there's a scarcity of accessible human astrocytes in the brain environment. Um, you can't get at them, right? And it's why he got in the game in the first place. Um, but even using pluripotent stem cell derived, you know, astrocytes, the, the cortical brain organoid systems are, are limited currently in their efficiency in generating astrocytes. And you just, you know, from the jump, it's tough. They require extended time to acquire glial competency in, in the human organoid system that astrogliogenesis uh, starts at three months of differentiation. Uh, and then the maturation process lasts for over a year after that. So yeah, I mean, if you, unless you want to do your cultures for a year before you can even start an experiment, it's a pretty tough system to get into. And of course, we've been talking in, in recent weeks episodes, years even, about all the attempts that have been made to accelerate maturation of all cell types, specifically neural, you know, with the gen tonics we've talked about. There's like hacks with transcription factors. Even in, in um, glia, there is this, uh, you can transiently express these gliogenic factors, but it, it remains to be seen whether or not these hacks really approximate a, uh, you know, glia that are, are bona fide and are going to function and model disease in the way you want, right? Um, and the other thing is, we haven't even talked about blood circulation, right? You know, organoids in vitro, they don't have it. Uh, but in the brain, you know, the brain's highly vascularized um, with systemic circulation connection via the blood brain barrier, sure, but they're hooked up, right? And uh, the astrocyte projections even surround vessels. So there's a lot of communication between the brain, the brain cells, glia, and, and circulation, as you might expect. You've got to have communication between the brain and the blood, keep things right. Right. So to you know, address all these limitations, uh, the Gage Group, they developed a protocol here. This is a nature biotechnology, going to be widely cited, a great tool. Um, and the key here is that at three weeks uh, of differentiation, uh, they induce this gliogenic switch by spiking the media, the astrocyte media, with uh, PDGF-AA, right? And that priming those cells enabled a, a rapid differentiation to astroglial identity, such that by eight to 10 weeks, you had a 25 to 30%, 25 to 31%, actually, 
uh, of the population that was uh, the the right identity. And then, uh, as uh, Rusty's famous for doing, he transplanted these organoids in vivo, showed that they generate the, a pretty diverse repertoire of these cortical neurons, including uh, different subclasses of astrocytes that are representative of the different layers, right? And they show this by doing uh, spatial transcriptomics. We're going to see a lot of papers coming through in the next few months and years that are using this spatial. I just saw 10x came in. I was always crowing about the limitations there with the 50 micron resolution. They just come up with the high def, that's two micron, which if that is legit, is pretty insane and is going to revolutionize our ability to see uh, all the information that's going on in these cells. So looking forward to that. I don't think he went that deep with the high def here, but nevertheless, the spatial transcriptomics showed in these specific layers of astrocytes that they indeed represented distinct uh, subclasses. Um, and they, among those, they identified the subpopulation of astrocytes that was pro-inflammatory, right? So there was a mechanistic uh, advance there, uh, identifying that key player. So a lot of studies gonna follow from that in terms of pro-inflammatory -infl pathways in the brain uh, heavily implicated in, in neurodegenerative disease. Also, another hook here is this looking at CD38, identifying CD38 as a critical signaling factor in mediating uh, both metabolic and mitochondrial stress. Again, two things that are key players um, in, in presumably in, in mediating uh, both, you know, brain health, as well as uh, pathology there. So as I said, this, this is like a, a one of these platform type papers, as you would expect in Nature Biotech from a big deal researcher in a big group where they lay down the methods for kind of kicking open a door. You know, they, they set up this tool that gives you significant amount of glia to work with in, in the first place. Um, and then they apply it to show how, how powerful it is. Uh, so a bunch of tools and methods converging on mechanistic uh, advance, but uh, more than that, I would say a platform that's going to be widely applied in you know the ever burgeoning world of modeling neurodegenerative disease. Yeah, absolutely, and I think this is just the latest in a long line of studies coming from Rusty Gage's lab in in the similar vein of transplanting. Uh, cortical tissues, human cortical and neural tissues into um, animal models, mouse models, for example. Um, this is another one of them. It's a Nature Biotech article. I, I mean, these articles honestly get a lot of publicity, a lot of press, because there's an element that captures the public's imagination anytime you're transplanting human tissues but uh, into into the mouse brain. But like I said, this has been done in some capacity for decades now. But I think the exciting part here is, for one, Utilizing this new type of cortical organoid and this glia or enriched cortical organoid um, in in the transplantation approach, but also like what you're alluding to the deep characterization. All right, this is a lot of deep single cell revealing the maturation of these things long term in the mouse brain. So it's the combination of these things that ultimately culminate in such a high profile paper or paper like this. And um, we'll see what happens next from Rusty Gage's lab. He is you know, one of the icons in our field, right? Yeah. And I mean, he's he's really helped to demystify the complexity of the brain, right? By looking at this single cell resolution approach from the beginning. I think that 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 human pluripotent stem cells for him were just a lever. Uh, and he's used that lever to really pry open uh, the cranium, I guess you would say, if you want to get grim. But I mean, the important part of all these studies, I think, is that even now we continue to identify subtly nuanced cell types um, that we, we didn't appreciate that before. You know, I say it over and over. We talk about 200 odd cell types, but it's not that, you know, there's all there's a whole spectrum in between these those 200 that it's almost silly to put a number on it. Um, I, I think the important thing here is identifying these signatures and then trying to assign function to them. And, and that's what's going to be really exciting here. As you said, using this glia enriched approach, now you can really explore the diversity of the glia uh, and, and the nuance of their function 
in, in a model that really has, I think, all the pieces in it, or it has the potential to incorporate all the pieces there going in vivo. Um, and perhaps at some point, you know, being explored in the context of like these behavioral models in, in mice. And that's, that's the dream, right? When we're talking about the brain, it's so hard uh, to, to make a link between the pathology, the biology, the anatomy, and the behavior. And, and this really has a potential to address all those gaps. Yeah, absolutely. It makes me wonder if, you know, these some of these glial enriched organoids could be adapted by somebody like Sergio Pasca, for example, to create another, yet another class of assembloids that they might be working on. And who knows, maybe they're already collaborating in this regard. But, you know, you're you're totally right. I think back in the day, the the traditional cell types that got all the publicity in the brain and the heart were the functional ones, right? The neurons, the cardiomyocytes. But as we know, the support cell types like the glia have a tremendous, tremendous role in regulating the proper function of that respective organ. So don't hate on those support cell types. You know what I mean? So moving on to a, a nature paper that's coming from somebody who we've actually covered a couple of times here on the show, Omar Yilmaz over there in Boston, MIT at Harvard. But also co-corresponding author on this paper is uh, Judith Agudo, again, also in, in Boston. Um, this is a tumor organoid paper, really. It's a paper about colorectal cancers um, and how certain transcription factors that are traditionally associated with development might actually have a dual role in enabling the immunization of early colorectal adeno adenomas and uh, various other types of cancers. So that's the name of the, that's the title of the paper. SOC 17 enables immunization of early colorectal ad adenomas and cancers. First author here is um, Norhira Goto. So, you know, Cancer is characterized by a lot of things. You got cell proliferation, cell migration, all these signaling pathways that go awry. But another hallmark of cancer is the avoidance of immune destruction, right? Cancers can avoid, tumors can avoid getting targeted by immune systems and the immune cells to prevent them getting, from getting destroyed uh, early on during the, the carcinogenesis process. So, I mean, they've this this has been investigated for a while. Um, it's been primi primarily investigated in advanced or metastatic cancers. So the real trick here is figuring out how this happens early. How do those cancer cells evade the immune system at the early um, oncogenesis step, right? So like the pre-malignant or early invasive tumors, how do they actually ev evade immune detection? And what they did is actually understand that exact process in early colorectal cancers or CRCs they uh, looked at naive colon cancer organoids. These are primary organoids, primary naive colon cancer organoids that were actually engineered in vitro to harbor either an APC null KRAS mutation and as well as a, a P53 null, TRP53 null uh, mutation. And these custom organoids can adapt to the in vivo, in vivo native colon environment. Um, so after making these models, right, these KR, KRAS mutant and P53 null model organoids, they did a bunch of characterization, right? Uh, transcriptomic chromatin analysis. And the, the key here in this paper, and I think part of the reason why it became a nature paper is because the factor that they identified, SOX17, um, that actually uh, was highly upregulated in these custom organoids to enable them to avoid uh, immune evasion, it's 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 such a unique. It, it's a it's not something you would have thought of in the first place. SOC seventeen is a hallmark transcription factor associated with endoderm differentiation, and they're finding here that it's actually really important for immune evasion. And I think that's that's the mind blowing part of this paper is you would have never thought that it's a factor like that that's really critical to have this dual role in immune evasion as well. And that's kind of the driving force behind the, the whole paper here. It was really strongly upregulated in vivo, the SOC-17, to, to uh, induce this immune evasion. So whereas the loss of SOC-17 didn't actually affect the organoid propagation in vitro, its loss markedly reduced the ability of these tumors to persist in vivo because of that immune evasion phenotype, right? Um, and so there's a small fraction of SOC17 null tumors that actually displayed a, an interferon gamma response, um, which enabled the T cells to infiltrate. In contrast, 
to the immune suppressive microenvironment in the wild type counterparts. So that's their the way of confirming that it's really SOX17 that's mediating this uh, immune evasion phenotype. So they dove into that interfering gamma response a little bit more and also uh, found that the SOX17 can engage a fetal intestinal uh, program that's driving the differentiation away from those canonical LGR5 positive tumor cells that you know we've been talking about a lot uh, that are found in the gut and also found in, in, in gut cancer, colon cancer. They sh that differentiation is shifted away to produce immune evasive LGR5 negative tumor cells with actually a lower expression of MHC complex uh, uh, proteins. So ultimately, the the bottom line of this paper and why I thought I thought it was really cool is that it revealed a role for SOC17, this canonical marker of endoderm differentiation. Uh, it revealed a, a dual role for it in immune evasion in early oncogenesis, all right? It's a transcription factor that's engaged during the early steps of colon cancer to create an immune evasive program that ultimately can lead to further colorectal cancer initiation and pro propagation. It's honestly kind of mind-blowing to me. I mean, some of these transcription factors are so built into our minds as developmental biologists as having these distinct and discrete developmental roles. And this is just throwing a wrench at that entirely, right? So it makes me wonder what other transcription factors like SOX17 are doing in a totally random, non-traditional context. Yeah, I mean, it's not a crazy idea, like in terms of the idea of like reverting to a to an embryonic identity, right? And he's in the terms of oncogenic transformation. That that's been a well, I think, studied. But here, it's it's how it does it, um, and yeah, elevating this SOC seventeen, which it's not just even expressed in, in endoderm. I mean, hematopoiesis is SOC seventeen is, is an important factor. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me. The the I was similarly surprised, um, and not to mention that colon cancer. I mean, of all cancers out there, I'm not you know a cancer biologist, but it's like on the rise, and alarmingly, um, particularly uh, amongst younger men. Um, so this is something that's it's a really important and timely study. My my question would be, and of course I'm all for the the insight. Um, and the understanding of, of what links uh, SOC17 to tumor evasion in this model. But I'm clinically speaking, like they showed very well that if you knock out SOC17, that the, the tumors then lose their ability to evade. Is that the idea to try and try and knock out SOC17? Because, you, you know, we all know the thing is with tumors, you just need one of those cells to sneak away and who knows about delivery. But I wonder, and I wonder if these studies aren't already ever underway, um, what I'd like to see is what are the downstream, as you you alluded to it, interferon gamma, like what's SOX17 doing there? Um, I think that's the next studies. We can try and get something that's druggable uh, to, to unmask uh, these, these sneaky tumor cells uh, that do evade via SOX17. So put another arrow in the quiver. Uh, and I can imagine that the, 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 it's not a new idea and that you're probably moving into that in that direction. It's a more druggable paradigm. Yeah, no, you're you're hundred percent. And it's almost like you read <laughs> the associated press release <laughs> with this paper, which I did, by the way. Sorry about that. Spoiler alert. Uh, but you're totally right because that is something that uh, Dr. Yelma has actually mentioned. You know, it's very hard to target as you might imagine, SOC17 for clinical therapeutics. It's like, you know, like we're talking about a relatively ubiquitous transcription factor involved in not just, you know, colon cancer initiation, but also, you know, developmental processes. So it's very hard to target that factor, right? But you're totally right. What they're actually looking for are the downstream effectors, like the interferon gamma pathway. Uh, that's what might be a more, quote, druggable target for early colorectal cancer initiation. So uh, so you're definitely doing your homework there, Dale. <laughs> My intuition is on point. Also, just thinking, I mean, if you want to talk about other cancers, whatever you find for SOC17, you got to wonder, SOC17 may be doing, I know this, we're talking about the colon, and it's implicated embryonically, yeah, yeah, yeah. But hey, if SOC17 has some role in tumor evasion, 
maybe maybe it'll fly in another system. So excited to see what comes of that. I, I talked about SAC 17 being a little bit promiscuous. Yeah, it's also involved in hematopoietic specification and differentiation. I got a story along those lines here that is a bit of a moonshot that I think a lot of people didn't think would come around, even with the you know advent of these complex organoids and with multiple cell types. Here we're talking about a, a bone marrow organoid, guys. Um, this is a story from Christoph Klein. He's at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, Germany. Um, so yeah, I mean, we know about the bone marrow briefly. It's the niche, right? It's it's where you enable continuous differentiation of all the cell types in the body while also maintaining self-renewal of a lifelong pool of hematopoietic stem cells, right? And the niche is comprised of a lot of different cell types, and that's why it's a moonshot, right? There's vascular uh, and mesenchymal cells. Uh, there's been debate for decades about the niche, a mesenchymal niche, a vascular niche, osteoblastic niche. Um, and all those things, it turns out, are probably true in, in some uh, to, to some degree. Um, but the genesis of the, the niche happens at fetal stages um, in the bone marrow. Uh, and it's not just about, I, I am really interested in it because it's the holy grail for me. I failed and died on a hill trying to generate hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent stem cells. But, you know, someone's going to do it. In fact, it didn't line up with our schedule, but there was a paper end of December from Terry Gifredo and Lawrence Armand um, from the Inserm in France, where they generated engraftable hematopoietic stem cells without, you know, any kind of modifications, no viral overexpression or anything. They did it in embryoid bodies, like kind of back to the future method. That's for another roundup, perhaps already passed, but I thought I'd mention it because it was a big deal story and it's been decades in the making. Um, but, you know, it's not just about generating hematopoietic stem progenitor cells from pluripotent stem cells, or even self-renewing existing hematopoietic stem cells that exist in the bone marrow. Uh, understanding and modeling the bone marrow niche is also really key to understanding pathology, hematological malignancy. It's been shown that if you mutate the bone marrow niche, it's enough to induce myelodysplasia or even leukemia, right? So there's a lot of reasons that you want to model the bone marrow. Um, and, you know, the existing models being mostly mouse, where really an amazing uh, body of work has been done. So all credit to the mouse, we love you. But there's a lot of species-specific differences, as you imagine, um, in hematopoiesis between the little mice and us humans. So we need a model, and that's where Christoph Klein's lab comes in. They have a, a method here, this is a Nature Methods paper, where they... Uh, combined, they did a, a, a kind of a one-step differentiation um, from human-induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, they generated these BMOs, they call them bone marrow organoids that had, uh, and the imaging here is great. We were talking about before the show, they have some nice like 3D renderings that really convey the network here and all the unique cell types residing in the niche and proximal to those niche sustaining cells. So uh, great imaging to support their point um, and illustrating it. There's like a vascular network. They've got the mesenchymal cells that are actually multipotent. Um, they show that these things can support neutrophil differentiation. They could respond to inflammatory stimuli. They did some single cell seek, of course, showed that the, the there was a, a population there that lined up with hematopoietic stem progenitor cells. Um, in terms of functional differentiation, they showed they could uh, differentiate to lymphoid cells. So one of the measures of like a more definitive hematopoietic progenitor um, also show that they could engraft transiently into these immunodeficient mice, right? Uh, upon xenotransplantation. For, so all the hallmarks of a bone marrow organoid in terms of like function, in terms of uh, able to sustain and carry these hematopoietic cells, although long-term self-renewal not established. I think that's asking maybe too much of an in vitro bone marrow organoid. But uh, falling just short of that, I think they, they, they proved with pretty convincing data that these things functioned as a kind of mini bone marrow in a dish. 
Um, and then they even modeled the, the somatopoietic uh, deficiency or developmental defects um, with this B, BPS45 deficiency. Of course, they're using induced pluripotent stem cells. So they were able to model these inborn errors of hematopoiesis. Um, so all, all in uh, with the function, with the, the descriptive analysis of the seek uh, and, and this modeling of uh, inborn uh, error, I think they did a pretty good job. Uh, I came with two papers today, biotech and methods, I think are, are platform papers that are, are really going to be important in, in facilitating further insight and study. And in this case, I think uh, the, the system can be tweaked to the point where we, we do observe uh, the sustenance of, of a true and graftable hematopoietic stem cell. And that, I mean, that is everything. Yeah, that's the ultimate dream, I think. And like you're alluding to, there's so many people who are working towards that goal. Um, you know, this is also sort of a reflection on the power of primary versus IPS-derived organoids. I mean, this is an IPS-derived system, um, and I think there are certain advantages for using primary <laughs> like clinical grade organoids for various other screening applications, especially if you're studying cancer, right? It makes a lot of sense why you would want to use primary organoids in that regard, that aspect. This is, I guess, more of a developmentally oriented study. But I mean, like what you're alluding to, the the major limitation with this study is the limitation inherent in all IPS-derived studies, which is the immaturity of the organoids that you're ultimately deriving, right? And how far can you get ex vivo in this sort of culture, right? We know, and we've talked about it a million times here on the show, the bone marrow niche and the hematopoietic niche is, is, is so critically intertwined. Like those developmental programs are so critically intertwined to the, to the respective niche in which they actually develop, right? So you can't, I mean, the pessimistic part of me is saying you can't perfectly replicate that ex vivo. I mean, we uh, there's various other folks who completely disagree with me and are going towards that exact goal of creating that bona fide HSC completely ex vivo. Um, but that is the criticism associated with something like this, you know, is how close is it actually to the real thing. But, and like we were, we were actually talking about this before the show too, part of the exciting part of this paper is uh, I think very few people actually have the gall to call these, you know, things that they make a bone marrow organoid, right? We still haven't seen that very often. And so these folks are actually definitively calling them a complex bone marrow organoid, um, perhaps because there is a fear, a general fear in the field of, of referring to an organoid like that. Because as I'm talking about, you need that in vivo niche to further enhance the maturation of these things. I don't know. Maybe I'm just ranting a little bit. Um, maybe I'm just jaded from my time as an IPS biologist and I'm so um, in tune with the limitations of the IPS system. But hey, this is a, you know, it's a nature methods paper for a reason. Perhaps other folks can just build on top of this method, right? Yeah, man, I'm like you, I'm burnt out. I've seen so much of what you can't do firsthand with these things that, yeah, my, my, my first uh, my reflex is to is to think about the limitations, especially when there is such a like a defined endpoint as you know self renewal of adult hematopoietic stem cells or generation of bona fide uh, fetal hematopoietic stem progenitors. But um, yeah, you said it. They're they're modeling a, a fetal system here, and, and and they have to kind of disclaim that at the start, and that's probably why they go with this developmental inborn errors of hematopoiesis that manifest really at the primary phase, right? Um, but you know, George Box, statistician, said it right, and often quoted by us biological scientists: models are wrong, but some are useful. And in this case, I think the the uses outweigh the the shortfall um i i as one who gave up on generating pluri i mean hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent cells a long time ago uh i have turned my thinking to maybe focusing on what these things can do and uh i think this is, is a model that's wrong but is going to be quite useful yeah you know thanks for walking me away from the ledge they did there dale and i appreciate that but you're totally right it, it some models can be useful. All models wrong. Some are useful, and uh, it just depends on the context that you're that you're using them in. IPS derived models are, I think, very powerful for studying developmental paradigms because they're inherently mature, and you're 
trying to recapitulate that in vitro, uh, that developmental process in, in vitro, right? It's when you, and I, as I think as an IPS cardiomyocyte biologist, I can say this, it's when you try to approximate more advanced adult diseases, that's when those questions of immaturity really, really become problematic. Uh, but hey, there are ways to get around that too. You can artificially enhance maturation of the cell types that you're working in. I know that as a cardiac biologist for sure. So, you know, some models are useful. All models are wrong. We all know that, right? Anyways, moving on to a, um, a story, another organoid story. We're 444 four, 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 four here. Um, this is a primary organoid story, so we don't necessarily have to worry about any of those issues of immaturity. And this is a human lymphoma organoid model coming from Ash Alizadeh over there at Stanford. I actually used to work in the same building as uh, Dr. Alizadeh. First author here is Jenna uh, Kastenschmidt. It's a human lymphoma organoid model for evaluating and targeting the follicular lymphoma, tum uh, lymphoma tumor immune microenvironment. And the Alizade lab is really incredible when it comes to modeling um, diseases of the uh, blood cancers, basically different types of lymphomas, different types of uh, lymphatic issues, different types of cancers of the blood. This is really their expertise. Dr. Alzad is also a clinician scientist, so I think he has some unique insights into um, the applications of some of these models, right? Uh, so what they did is they did a story focusing on the, you know, addressing the heterogeneity in the tumor microenvironment, all right? Uh, because this is a this is a you know a, a serious consideration when it comes to clinical outcomes. There's uh, we know this like tumors are very different. There's especially in lymphomas like no two lymphomas, no two cancers are the same. And when you think about immunotherapeutic strategies, which are uh, antibody and cell based therapies, immunotherapies, blah blah blah, you know you can in some cases overcome. Uh, some of these issues with a tumor microenvironment and make it a more standardized therapy, right? Overcome pro-tumorigenic mechanisms for sustained disease control. That's the dream, right? Have one therapy that's going to work equally well across whatever patient population, but we're not quite there yet. So what they're doing here um, is basically modeling the intact tumor microenvironment of follicular lymphomas with its native syngeneic tumor infiltrating leukocytes. It's a it's a big problem and they're hoping to address it here. So here they developed this organoid culture, you know, like I said, four for four for organoids today, for growing patient-derived primary lymphoma organoids, which are including cells from the native um, uh, follicular lymphoma tumor microenvironment. I think that's that's pretty cool. So you're pulling these things out of the body, but you're still you know, like what we were alluding to in the past couple of Roundup papers, you're still maintaining their niche. The niche is almost like coming with the organoid as you pull it out of the body. Um, and then to really refine the method and to get it to the caliber of a cell stem cell paper, they uh, wanted to culture cryopreserved samples. This is really hard. Um, and I admire the hell out of them for doing this because Anytime you freeze thaw primary samples, you have a big, big problem. You have you know big issues when it comes to cell survival. I mean, you, you know about this, Dalon, as well as I do, right? So the fact that they're able to demonstrate the robustness of the method by culturing cryopreserved follicular lymphoma samples and create these organoids from them, uh, I think that's really commendable. And they, they didn't do it just from like a, a small number of patients. They had a broad range of diverse patients, different genetic backgrounds, and consistently were able to show um, that these, you know, uh, follicular lymphoma organoids can also encompass their tumor microenvironment and basically retain the cellular composition, tumor somatic mutations, gene expression profiles that are coming from that ancestral patient from where you derive it from. It's really, really cool. And then they did a, basically the immunotherapy, right? They treated these cryopreserved uh, patient-derived lymphoma organoids with uh, CD3 or CD19 or CD3, CD20 uh, antibodies and showed, you know, B cell specific killing and T cell activation. Um, and ultimately they established a really cool system, a really neat stable system that you can, uh, that you don't have to do from point of care. You can freeze these things. That's really, really cool. Um, it's a stable system that has a robust platform for uh, advancing precision medicine efforts. That's their words, right? Um, through patient-specific modeling of follicular lymphoma 
And hey, if you're able to freestyle these things and you're able to expand them rapidly, that integrates really well with high throughput screening, which is again, something that I think, you know, they, their lab and other labs at Stanford are really, really good at. They have a really good high throughput screening core. I think that's ultimately the next step for a paper like this. They're establishing the system. And ultimately, I think they're going to just apply the hell out of the system with the drug screening. Um, and uh, yeah, really great, really great model here. Really great story. And I, I love the way you presented it, that you really emphasize what I kept seeing here it was cryo preserve, cryo preserve, cryo preserve is so key. They should have put it in the title because that is is the difference between between being an idea. And I think we've been talking about and hearing about these ideas for such a long time because it's a great idea right that you have this avatar the patient avatar in 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 the form of the cancer cells right take the cancer out of the body figure it out then treat the patient it's such a great idea and is going to be essential in in putting forth and and uh bringing about this personalized medicine approach um but it needs to be practical right just you talk to mark tomashima and lorenz the first thing they had to do on the long road to that Blue Rock trial was they had to freeze thaw those cells and maintain the function and have them not go berserk, right? So the fact that they have a system here that is practical, I think is the most important element of this story. This is ready for prime time. We've been hearing about it forever. And now this is something that I feel like is in, in practice. I don't know about like FDA and all that, but this is kind of off label, something that I, I would say it should be in practice right now, we should be getting these primary tumor samples and we should be archiving them for research or better uh, to improve the treatment of that specific patient. I think we're ready, Arun, are we not? Yeah, I think you are. Uh, I think we definitely are as a, as a scientific community. Uh, but if you take this a step further, every single hospital has a biobank these days. And most major academic centers have a have really impressive primary tumor biobanks, samples from patients who have various types of cancers, not just follicular lymphoma. So it makes me wonder how well you could be able to extend some of these cryopreservation, freeze-thaw, uh, organoid production techniques to like other types of cancers as well. Um, I think there's just a gold mine of primary samples out there that can be directly applied in this exact same context. Maybe I'm just dreaming big, right? But hey, maybe down the road, that's uh, that's what's going to happen here. Well, I'm glad, buddy, because you were depressed after that last roundup. But now I think you're beginning to believe like Neo from the Matrix. He's beginning to believe we got you back on the bright side. Uh, and you're not the only one, you know. I've been tuning up on Marissa Scabuzzo's talks, all, all her papers, and I'm beginning to believe myself, although it didn't take much convincing with the quality of her research. We're going to talk to her in just a minute, but before we get there, I got a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. We'd like to remind our listeners about Intestinal Cell News, one of Stem Cell's free weekly scientific newsletters. Intestinal Cell News summarizes all the latest research, news, jobs, and events in intestinal cell research and delivers it right to your inbox every Friday. Save time and keep current with Intestinal Cell News. Subscribe for free at intestinalcellnews.com. All right, everyone. Today on the podcast, we have a special guest from Case Western University. She's a HHMI Hannah H. Gray Fellow in the laboratory of Paul Tizar. The goal of Dr. Scabuzzo's research is to understand the role of enteric glia in a healthy gut and how they respond to dietary, environmental, or genetic changes. Her research could lead to the development of novel and efficient medicines that may benefit people with gastrointestinal illnesses. Marissa, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. And I mean, like Dylan mentioned, your work really focuses on this unique cell population, these enteric glia, and how these diverse, highly dynamic cells actually ultimately can contribute to gastrointestinal health, disease, all these cool things, right? And part of it is like we love highlighting soon to be PIs here on the show. It's something we just love doing. Um, so why don't we actually just start off by letting you give an overview of the research that you want your soon to be open lab to to work on what do you guys what do you actually want to be working on in your new lab yeah so um it's really an extension of what i i've been doing and setting the stage to do um so like you mentioned enteric glia are a type of glial cell in the enteric nervous system so this is the nervous system all throughout your gut 
Um, it spans everywhere from your esophagus to your rectum, and it's in every single layer of the gut from the outside in. So it's they're really everywhere. And glial cells are highly abundant, but they've been largely understudied. There have been some fantastic groups who have been focusing on this. So I think like this field has been led by like Brian Goldbernson, Keith Sharkey, Vasil Pashneath. Um, but really, this is like still so much to know here. There's so much to learn and so much still to discover. Um, so I, I'm really hoping that my lab will, um, you know, really focus on understanding, gaining a mechanistic understanding into the functional uh, states and identities of enteric glial cells, both in healthy and in disease. So these cells really, they're all over the gut. So they're interacting with a whole bunch of different cell types because the gut is extremely diverse. I always joke because the lab I'm in, Paul Teaser's lab is a brain lab. And like I say, my gut, my, the gut is way more complicated than the brain. There's like, there's multiple germ layers there. Like you have, you have bacteria, you have everything, you have nutrients coming through. So like you have this really dynamic and unusual environment and glia are touching epithelial cells that secrete hormones. They're interacting with neurons. They're interacting with immune cells. They're, they're doing everything. And um, there's so, so little that we know yet and so much more to explore. So um, really um, my lab will be focused on developing new technologies to overcome many of the challenges that have prevented us from understanding these cells and then um, trying to define these functional states in a healthy gut and then what happens in all of these different environments when they can go wrong um, because they do seem to be changing in all of these. Yeah, I'll say in in the battle between my gut and my brain, sadly, my gut wins most of the time (laughs) to my great disservice. Oh, yes. (laughs) But uh, and speaking of like the career pathway, right? I mean, you're clearly on the, I guess, more traditional path, um, which although that's dynamic these days, uh, but, you know, the academic path, professorship, et cetera. Um, But the career pathway for scientists working with cell based applications is much, much richer than it was when I was closing out my postdoc phase. it was much more monolithic, obviously, in my day. Academia felt like the only option that wasn't a failure. But in some ways, I would say that that made choices a little bit easier because, you know, at least from this perspective, here I am having been fortunate and or productive enough, probably fortunate more than productive, uh, but uh, lucky enough to secure a position in a really competitive environment. But for you, it's kind of a different landscape. There's a, a much broader range of app options that are like exciting, um, perhaps more exciting mm-hmm. even than the, the more academic path, uh, but it's not without risk at the same time. I wouldn't say it's a clear cut path for you. Maybe all those choices can be overwhelming. For a lot of our listeners out there that may be approaching a similar threshold, uh, what guides your thinking or what guided your thinking um, seems like you're you're circling around the choice here and committing to academic path. But what what was the guide there in deciding between academic versus non-academic pathway? Or do do you even really have to decide? Do you see your future as being you know maybe some kind of uh, combination? Yeah, yeah. I think that's something that's really freeing now in academia. So many people are doing multiple things. People have companies on, on the side, or um, I have a nonprofit that I. Uh, started with my husband and my advisor. So like, there's so many other things you could be doing while also doing academic research. Um, The thing that really drew me to it in the first place is just the creative aspect, Um, just being able to think about any question that you're curious about and follow that and design experiments to address these questions. Um, I just really love that process. And that's something that I felt when I started in science was, it seemed restricted to academia, but like you said, now it's it's really not. There's so many jobs in, in industry and entrepreneurship, like different businesses and stuff, where you really can have that creative aspect where you might be, you know, focused on a specific goal, but you can design experiments and projects to achieve that. So um, it is definitely a different landscape now, which I think is great for trainees just to know there's so many options. And um, even if you love academia, but you don't want to stay in ac- academia, there's there's other things that can have a lot of those benefits to them. Um, but I, I, one of the things that draws me to it is also training. I love, I love working with new scientists and getting them excited, like seeing somebody else, like discover something for the first time and helping them like guide them to become independent scientists is so much fun. So like, I I think that's something that you don't get as much in other careers and it's really, really great in academia. Yeah. I think that's the, really the common thread across most academic scientists I'd like to think of is that, you know, the discovery, but also the mentorship part of it. We just, we're teachers at heart. We love teaching students. We love, you know, seeing the discoveries that they make um, and really, you know, uh, 
encouraging them to take whatever career trajectory they want to take, whether it's following in our footsteps as academic scientists or, you know, as you're talking about trying something new. Um, so focusing on a little bit on the more on the science that you're working on, you had this really cool bioarchive paper that you posted last year where you you and your colleagues from the lab actually showed that these enteric glial hub cells can coordinate intestinal mobility. It's a real, pretty new concept, right? I mean, you also, like you're talking about, you're excited about developing new methods. So you optimize this single nucleus RNA sequencing method where you can actually identify different classes of these enteric glia and define their morphological spatial diversity, right? Um, so it's the, the other really cool part of this was you revealed a subset of these glial cells called the hub cells. So I, I don't know if you could, did you tell us a little bit more about this work and maybe how this unique subtype of these hub cells could actually be targeted in GI diseases? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a great summary of the work. Um, really like setting out to try to define these more comprehensively was the goal here. Um, so people have shown that enteric glia might be heterogeneous. So people have shown some different morphologies. Um, people have shown that if you like remove enteric glia from the gut, then you have defects in motility, but nobody really knew are there actually functionally specialized subtypes of glia that have unique roles in this? Are they molecularly equipped to do different things? So that's really like what we wanted to see. Like, are there actually defined subtypes that are doing, you know, different things? Um, and using this new technique, it allowed us to capture um, glia from every layer of the tissue. So like I mentioned earlier, like these cells are everywhere from the outside in. They're between like these rough muscle layers that help with peristalsis and move things through your gut. But they're also in like the delicate submucosa in the lamina propria right underneath the epithelium. So if you're just going to select for one of these layers, which a lot of people have done in the past, you're kind of losing out on a lot of this diversity because you can imagine a cell that's sitting in the lamina propria touching an epithelial cell is going to be doing a lot the different things than a cell that's sitting in the muscle layer touching neurons. So um, this this gave us this unique um, opportunity to really molecularly profile these. And then we went back and tried to see like, well, where are these subtypes that we've now found? Where are they located? And then next is really, what are they doing? Um, and of course, in this first study, we're not going to be able to tell you what every single glial cell in the gut is doing. But we focused in on one, um, this hub cell, because we, we noticed strikingly it was a specific morphology, and it was 100% restricted to this one layer of the gut, the myenteric plexus. So this is between the muscle layers. And this kind of indicates that this cell might be playing a role in something that has to do with neuro, neural trans, uh, neurotransmission or motility. Um, so we got excited about that. And then we got even more excited when we looked at the molecular profile and found that they expressed a mechanosensory channel called piezo2. Um, so this allows cells to directly sense force. And if the cell is sitting there next to muscle cells, pacemaker cells, and neurons, and it's expressing this channel that allows it to sense force and then transmit that force into signal, then um, it made us think like, well, it's probably one of one of the cells that's allowing these glial cells to regulate gut motility. So um, for the first time, really seeing this is a subtype of cell and it's molecularly equipped to do this. Um, so it's so pretty exciting. Um, and this is really the first time that like defined subtypes of glia have been shown to execute normal functions in the gut. Um, which I think provides, like you said, like this this opportunity for them to become dysfunctional in so many different diseases, not only gastrointestinal diseases, but also like across neurodiversity, people who might have different genetic um, uh, changes in glial cells in their brain that cause differences. Those are also going to be affected in these glial cells in your gut. Um, and there's a huge comorbidity of gut changes in people with the different uh, neurological disorders and diseases. Um, so it, it was, it's been really exciting and there's just so much more still to learn because now we have this like global map of glia in the gut. Um, so we have, you know, years and years of work to be like defining what these cells are doing. And, um, there's, you know, six other cells that we've really identified here. Um, some of them we also see are spatially restricted, um, but even these hub cells, this is likely just one function of them. They're probably doing many different things. And we've, we've noticed that their function or their, their expression of piezo 2 decreases in age. So this, you know, provides a uh, suggestion that perhaps these cells are actually changing and aging when people are having gut changes, gut motility defects and stuff. So, Yeah, I, I love these, these types of story because, you know, they lay bare the fact that while we think, we always think we understand and we're putting a number on the, then how many cell types there are. This, there's this many. But then you look a little bit deeper. You know, it's like atoms. You break down the atoms and there's the quarks and the muons and all that stuff. There's always a deeper layer. Mm -hmm. And here with the single cell technology, we thought we had it all, but we didn't even. You know, there were cells you weren't seeing. You had to create new methods in order to identify that there were different cells. But not only that, then you assign this novel mm -hmm. mechanism to, to it that was like, a, I think, a, 
a real nice conceptual advance here, this idea of the kind of feed forward mechanism that you elucidated. You know, we all know that peristalsis is necessary for the intestinal motility, right? Um, so you need the neural conductive element, of course, but the idea that you need <laughs> the receptor, right, that piezo too on the neural, on the glia to receive the biomechanical input and then serve as the hub and then move it forward. I, I love it. So neat. It, it provides, like it closes the loop, right? Um, and that's just one <laughs> of the many, you know, two, I say, when you say the methods and then the, the piezo thing, but you know, another one of the major innovations that was embedded in the story is the microfluidic biochips that you use to illustrate mm -hmm. the relationship, you know, to really show uh, the relationship of the, you know, the biomechanical piezo 2 and the glia. How do those chips yeah. work? And I mean, you talk about how pervasive mm -hmm. uh, the role of ent enteric glia are in, you know, different genetic backgrounds in the context of neurodegenerative disease. Uh, is there ideas that you have not to to blow your you know your big secret <laughs> you open a new lab, but maybe how you how you expect to or hope to apply this new tech? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to share all my ideas. That's the fun thing too about academia is like I think people who are junkies for this like you just have ideas all the time and you just keep having ideas. So it helps you to prioritize and like kind of um, see what other people are excited about too. Um, yeah, those microfluidic devices were so fun. It was also just like a pain in the butt though. So those things, it's like you have this 3D tissue because we're doing, we're taking the outside layer of the gut out off. So this has got muscle, pacemaker cells, neurons, and glia. So it's three dimensional. And then we stick it on matrix gel in these microfluidic chips. So they're like printed out so you can stick them in these little wells. So you have to get them to adhere. Once they're adhering and we can see that they're contracting so they're healthy, that kind of passes our QC that we could use them. Um, and that's already, you know, kind of challenging on its own to get high quality tissue. But then we took it a step further to make it harder on ourselves. And we decided, well, let's see, are these calcium responsive? So like we're doing it now in transgenic mice and trying to do imaging on three dimensional tissue of individual cells. But then, OK, that wasn't hard enough. Let's put some fluid in there and start making things move. So now like the tissue is like kind of moving. You're trying to like capture one individual cell under this like sheer stress force. So it really was like at some point felt like a needle in a haystack just to try to find the glial cells that you can get in focus while you're doing this assay. But um, really, really exciting. Like I felt like a little kid a lot of the times, like kind of embarrassing with the other people I was working with. because I would jump up and down like when we got a glial cell that we thought was mechanosensitive and um, really, really fun. But yeah, these have a lot of different applications. Um, we're using them, you know, to look at uh, model uh, uh, forced. So um, these cells, these hub cells are in the muscle layer. So they don't actually see luminal flow. Like they don't see the contents moving across the gut. They feel stretched, but the shear stress works as a great model just to model the opening of like these mechanosensitive channels. Um, and we could use this for a lot of different things where there's, there's defects in peristalsis. So per peristalsis or the movement of contents through the gut is defective in a lot of different disorders, syndromes, diseases. Um, so this allows us to really access this. Um, and one of the technologies that um, my lab will be using and I'm using for other projects at the moment is using um, pluripotent stem cell derived intestinal organoids that are innervated with the enteric nervous system. So we can grow, grow three dimensional miniature human guts and put the entire in enteric nervous system on there. They innervate the intestinal organoid. Um, but now we can access patient tissue and actually grow patient organoids and see patient specific enteric nervous system dysfunction. Um, and these things have a lumen, so you can actually hook them up to these fluidic devices mm -hmm. and um, model motility. And, and they get mature enough if you transplant them that they actually start undergoing peristalsis in a dish. So this is all based off of uh, Jim Wells and Jason, uh, Jim Wells and uh, Maxine Mahe's paper in like 2018, I think, in Nature, um, where they innervated these intestinal organoids with the enteric nervous system. Um, and they have a beautiful video where they added like some chemical stimulants and you could see like the, the gut just contracting. And I remember actually I was at ISSCR when I saw that video, he presented, Jim, Jim Wells was there and he presented and it just blew my mind. I was like, oh my gosh, that's so, that's so cool. So it's really like kind of humbling just to be able to be doing it ourselves now and, and see the same thing. Yeah, it's such a cool model system. I mean, like a, a picture says a thousand words, a video says a million, right? I mean, as somebody who works mm -hmm. on 
moving tissues and cardiomyocytes, I can totally, totally understand the, the lore of working with those kind of things. And also as somebody who works on microfluidic organ ships, I can also agree with you in that these things can be a big pain in the butt. That is for sure. I mean, yeah, yeah. we're seeing a lot of the same issues when it comes to the fidelity of the chips, but ultimately if you pick and choose your application, right, they can be so powerful. Like for us, we're seeing maturation of cardiomyocytes just by putting these things on the chip, stretching them, like, you know, mimicking a heartbeat, biomechanical stretch, all this kind of stuff, fluid flow. So, yeah, I mean, these are cool technologies. They have their limitations, but you got to pick and choose their applications for sure. I feel yeah. like, um, you know, like science isn't complicated enough. So we decided we don't want to just know the mechanism of what's happening. We want to look at it in a cell that's also moving around and then <laughs> also like activate, you know, there's just like so many moving pieces and parts. So, um, yeah, it's fun. And it's fun. I mean, definitely fun. I mean, there's not that many of us who can work with like stuff that moves actually in culture. <laughs> so I think we're kindred spirits in that way. Um, shifting gears a little bit, you know, you're an HHMI hand gray fellow, which is awesome. Like we mentioned that at the top of the show, it's this amazing, amazing program that actually financially supports diverse trainees as they transition to becoming independent PIs. It's, you know, one of those hallmark career development awards that we all strive to get. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a really important program in part because it seeks to increase diversity in the professoriate by supporting early career researchers, not just financially, but also with this amazing network of kindred spirits and, you know, other scientists in the similar, similar boat, right, making that jump. I mean, uh, could you tell us a little bit just more about the program itself for folks who might not be familiar with it and how it's been so critical for you as you make that next step? Yeah, yeah. It's a really a remarkable program. Um, and I, I still am just in shock that I, I'm part of this group. But the HHMI community just in general is just a fantastic community, both of scientists, which of course you hear HHMI and you think of scientific excellence, but also just of people. Like These are people that care about each other and care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They care about um, the future of science and making labs healthy environments. So um, really, really great to be a part of it. Um, and I mean, yes, there's great financial benefits. Um, I'll have a million dollars to start my lab. So basically starting with an R01 already. Um, and this is unrestricted funding, which is great because then I could do some really wacky stuff, which I have planned some like crazy, crazy science that we could talk about maybe another day once I have some more data on them. But um, but what's also really great is they, they have like annual meetings for Hannah Gray fellows that they keep us connected. So we have like a lot of other, um, kind of like, uh, career readiness programming and things to help us prepare for independent faculty careers. Um, and they know, like we're coming from different walks of life. Like a lot of us, um, I mean, I, I didn't know what a scientist was for a long time. I thought I wanted to be a brain surgeon because of my mom wanted me to be a doctor because that was success to her. And I was like, what's the coolest sounding doctor? So I didn't know like this even existed as a career. And now you have people that know every step that it takes to be successful, like sitting down with you, caring about you and trying to help you through it, but also like caring about like you as a person, which is just so different. Um, so really an amazing program. I know there there's applications open now. I don't know if by the time the podcast is out, if they'll still be open, but um, I highly encourage people to apply. I actually applied twice. I got rejected the first time. And I know a lot of people that applied twice. Um, so as long as you're eligible, keep applying. Um, think of, you know, your biggest, craziest ideas and write them on paper and send them in. Yeah. Rejected? I don't even believe it. You're an amazing kid. <laughs> but we all get rejected. I'm going to be rejected my entire life. I, took, I got rejected by my wife and it took like about six months to talk her and go on a date with me. So that's how I got into science, probably my yeah. first big one. Um, anyway, you know, not just uh, HHMI, you're also a recipient of the nice of Drucken Miller Fellowship. Coincidentally, I, I was also a Drucken Miller Fellow. And before that, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, a real big name fellowship like the Hannah Gray, but I had a year as a HHMI fellow. It was enough for me to go to one of those meetings you talked about at the campus mm -hmm. where it was such an amazing immersion, like you said, introduction to like scientists at the highest level, the biggest names, and just their way of thinking and how casual the atmosphere was, you know, mm -hmm. it's like seeing these people in their element and being like, okay, a little, you know, disillusioning, demystifying and inspiring, uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I remember there was like a very similar big picture, of course, uh, with HHMI, but a considerably different culture between like HHMI and NICEF, just as an example. Um, both of those experiences being really pivotal in shaping my career and having tremendous value. And it wasn't just about the money, although I, like you, have been rejected and uh, having the funding is a tremendous security. But 
you know, I had a well-funded PI also like you uh, and mentor who gave me a very long leash, which I assume Paul gives you. So it's not like I would have been sitting on my hands if the money hadn't come through. Um, and like I said, there were plenty of times that the money didn't come through with the grants and I was still working. So, so what has your funding success meant to you? I mean, you said how you got some wacky ideas coming into your own lab. Um, and of course, there is that element. You got to acknowledge that none of this work would be possible without the funding. But like what other dimensions specifically, I would say, like the HHMI experience, you come in there and you're surrounded by Nobel Prize winners. And then you go to NICEP and it's a different atmosphere and in a different way, in a great way, where it's, I think, really good at, at interfacing with the, the public sector and, the, and the, even the private sector. There is this mm -hmm. a different group of people who are all looking toward the same goal, but by a different mechanism. Could you speak to like any differences in your experiences there and the value, uh, respective values that these two different kind of mechanisms have? Yeah, definitely. And ISF is incredible. They um, they actually they funded me within like the first two months of my postdoc and they took a huge risk on me, which was like just life changing. I, I don't think I would have gotten the Hannah Gray if I hadn't had some ISF. I think that that gave me some like, I don't know, uh, what's it called? Like Jeez. now I have have like street cred. I've got <laughs> I've got like nice stuff, you know, like I'm cool. I, I'm in the group. Um, but I, I can see what you mean, like that they are a bit different just that. HHMI is very academia focused. It's very basic science, which um, is amazing. But like NYSEF also has such a diversity of, of what they're doing and like who they're, like you said, who they're interacting with. Like they're interacting with industry and um, philanthropists and like trying to bring in science education outreach. And um, they're doing so much for the community. So it's really, really cool just to see a group that's able to um, do so many different things and walk so many different walks because it feels like they're really like changing the footprint, you know, I don't know if that makes sense, but, yeah. um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, both tremendous programs and speaking of, you know, career development and outreach, you got, also have a, a passion for outreach. That's for sure. You have this science nonprofit that you co-founded rise up Northeast Ohio. I mean, its mission is to build, you know, bring equity to public school education by providing this amazing scientific experience to different students in Cleveland, especially uh, inner, inner city students. Um, it's, you know, historically viewed as an underserved community in Cleveland, Ohio. So tell us more about this cool initiative, how it got started, what you hope to accomplish, all about it. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, have you guys ever heard of a glass floor in science careers? Have you heard of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So some people might might not have. So a glass ceiling, everybody has heard of. But like a glass floor is like unless your parents make over a certain amount, you can't even enter a science career. So it's like this barrier to entry. And if you were to walk into a research lab, which we all work in research labs, you look around, the majority of people come from upper middle class backgrounds. Um, and I, I always was curious, like, why is this like this, you know? Um, and when you really look at the system here in the United States, um, you can see that the public school system is a little bit like broken. There's a lot of inequities that exist there. Um, so when there's funding disparities between different public schools based on like the income level of, of the, um, the the school in the area, um, the science classes suffer the most. Science is so expensive. Um, it's incredibly expensive to teach. So if you have a school that has a whole bunch of resources, they're able to be better equipped to do different things that um, other schools won't be able to have the opportunity to. Um, I went to public schools. I love the idea of what public schools should be doing, but we just live in a broken society where we don't have that. Um, so we kind of came into this wanting to do something, you know, whatever we could to try to bring more opportunity and hands-on experiences to students in um, low funded public schools around Cleveland. Um, and what we ended up coming up with is, pretty creative and I'm, I'm really excited about it. So we call it the life as a scientist program. So I actually hated science when I was a kid. Like I'd go to science classes. My mom wanted me to be a doctor, like I mentioned, because that was like success. Um, and I would try my best, but like, I kind of hated it because they'd be like, here's a textbook, read this thing somebody discovered and then do it yourself. And if you don't do it right, this experiment doesn't work, you're going to fail. And that's like kind of my idea of like what science is going to be like. But then in practice, it's like daydreaming about things you're curious about. It's like thinking outside of the box. It's writing grants, pitching ideas, um, you know, doing the experiments, but making mistakes along the way and writing it down and figuring it out and then publishing and presenting your, your work. So we actually have them do all of that. They, they come up with their own experimental ideas. So every student will um, daydream about anything. We tell them there's no bounds. There's no bad questions in science. And then they write a grant and they submit it to us. And we have a study section and review their grants. And then we 
pick ones to fund. They work in teams to collaborate and um, we bring in all of the equipment and supplies and they do all of their experiments on invertebrate um, animals. So they're actually using like live organisms, learning how to like work with Drosophila or C. elegans or planaria, you know, different things that are used in real research labs um, to answer, you know, whatever question that they have. Um, like I said, these are all high school students. They're all in ninth and 10th grade. So most of their questions are like um, something to do with sleep, music, or marijuana. <laughs> but, you know, it's important questions for their community. So, you know, these are things that they're thinking about. And it's like, well, those are important scientific questions. So we have some Drosophila experiments that right now they're on a rotator. They've been on a rotator for two weeks because they're doing sleep deprivation. And they're going to dissect their brains and run a Western blot. We have another group that has hermit crabs that they're feeding CBD. Of course, we're not going to bring THC into a high school. But we have CBD oil that these hermit crabs are exposed to. And they're actually, it's pretty cool. They've built this device with a webcam and this big box. And they like have silly putty that they put the shell of the hermit crab on. And they're actually putting like a predator on the screen, flashing at it to see like the retraction to see their question is like, does CBD make us more calm? So like seeing if these like hermit crabs have like a delayed response. So it's pretty fun. Those are just two. We have, I think like 27 different proposals funded across different schools, but um, seeing these students, you know, learn that, it's okay not to know the answers or what to do next. It's okay to kind of make it up as you go. It's it's fun to like daydream and come up with crazy ideas. And at the end, they they publish it and present to us. So it's, it's pretty exciting. That is just about the most inspiring and cool thing I've heard in a long time. I love that. Although I got to have a look it's, at the eye cook on that snail experiment. <laughs> yeah, luckily, actually, invertebrates are all uh, no eye cook needed, except for, for some reason, octopus, which I guess I, I agree. That's fair. That's um, fair. But it's been pretty fun, too, just because, like, I'm the scientific director. My husband's actually the executive director, so he's, like, full time doing this, like, running operations because it's very intensive. But um, I run all of the scientific aspects and um i've had to babysit like the model organisms before and we had like a bunch of madagascar hissing cockroaches that were actually in our house and our cat kept bothering them so we moved them to our two-year-old's closet and then i just felt like a terrible mom because i'm like my two-year-old sleeping and in her closet there's like 17 madagascar hissing cockroaches <laughs> but it's, it's been pretty fun just like having these different animals around and um planaria is one of my favorite things in the world to see like their little eyes and i'm a developmental biologist by training so yeah fun some parents are uh, hiding the gummies and you're hiding oh, i don't even know what you're hiding that <laughs> it's just like a <laughs> virtual zoo up in there um yeah. anyway moving on you know not your your home uh which has a lot of organisms that we're going to talk about later but your home university case western mm -hmm. which just about here's some fun facts just about 200 years ago founded as the yale of the west if you didn't know that, it has been Ooh. a bastion of progressive ideology. Its origin and founders were strongly associated with the abolitionist movement. Probably know that. Um, it was the first college west of the Appalachian Mountains to enroll and graduate an African-American student and the second medical school to graduate a woman. So very progressive. Also a, a strong scientific history. First American to win a Nobel Prize in science. That's pretty impressive. First blood transfusion, chlorination of drinking water. We're all fans of that. Uh, and oh yeah, this guy Paul Tizar, I know, who on the strength of and genius of scientists like yourself is uh, driving tremendous innovation in neural space. You won't find a lot of sonnets written about Ohio, but uh, do you guys at Case realize the scientific bedrock that you're walking around on every single day? Whether or not you do, uh, I bet you love it there or else you wouldn't stay. I, I feel like you're from, I do. you're from Ohio. Yes. Yeah, I think you were, you're from Ohio. I'm not. I actually, I'm from Houston, Texas, but I did my undergraduate uh, okay. in Ohio. So my husband's from here. So it feels like home. I love Cleveland and Case Western is just a fantastic environment. The school of medicine here, there's just so much support and um, not only like the scientific excellence, but it, it just feels like, you know, a friendly environment where you can collaborate with people and like move things forward. So and Paul's amazing. He's like one of the coolest people in the world. It's, it's been so fun to work with him. Oh, absolutely. I can I can attest to that. Although forever uh, here, I'm telling the whole world I was calling him Paul Tazar, and he just let me. He just let me call him Paul Tazar for about ten years. So if you're, if you're calling Paul Tazar out there, his his name is actually pronounced Paul Tazar. Though leave it leave it to uh, Marissa here to educate me to that. I learned as of today. I, I was this years old, this many days old when I learned. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, Marissa, we're going to get on to the peripheral questions. Arun, you're going to kick off those? Yeah, let's do it. So here's some science peripheral questions for you, uh, just to help us get you know get to know you a little bit better. Um, first of all, what's the biggest misconception about science that you'd like to resolve? 
Yeah. So I probably talked about this a little bit talking about like outreach and stuff and just like me growing up, not knowing what a scientist was, but like, I think, well, first off, scientific questions and problems are really complex. So they really require lots of different perspectives and ways of thinking and to solve them and stuff. But I grew up thinking that like you had to be, of course, everybody pictures Albert Einstein as a scientist, but I like pictured not only Albert Einstein, but you have to be meticulous and organized. And that's not me. I'm not that. Um, of course, that's great. That can make your life easier as a scientist, like if you're really organized and, and meticulous, but you don't have to have those skills to be a good scientist. We need some people that are like complete wild cards in the lab. As long as you're taking good notes, you know, like you can skip a few steps in your protocol, write it down, and maybe you'll discover something new. Um, and we need people who are artists and who are able to like hear the molecular symphony that we're like trying to imagine. And we need people that are organized and rigid who can just be like reliable and just get stuff done. But um, it's just really like, we, we don't have to be all of it at once. Like we have to have a group of people that we can assemble. That's like all different people from like different backgrounds and different walks of life to like, let us have these skill sets and see things uniquely so that we can actually answer these questions. So I think that's like the biggest misconception is just like, what do you have to have to be successful in science? And I, I would say nothing. <laughs> you just have to be, you have a unique, be yourself and have a unique perspective. Absolutely. Just be yourself. And you got to hear that molecular symphony. I love that. I'm going to use that in my grant <laughs> applications. <laughs> Next no, that's nice. awesome. Um, wrapping things up, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given, whether it's professional or not? Yeah. So actually, this is like the way to think about science. This is the one that I thought was really creative. Um, and then I'll, I'll follow it up about advice, uh, advice I've ignored. But um, my PhD advisor, Gosha Borowiak, um, she one time I was I came to her with like some crazy cloning idea like I love like genetic engineering so I was like let's like clone all of this stuff together and make this new cell line and she's like okay hold on a second let me just tell you the story and I was like okay let's hear the story and she said I don't know if the story is true by the way I have to preface that so she said a long time ago when cars were first invented they started increasing their ability to go fast and cars were getting faster and faster and people were dying at crazy rates because like they'd get into crashes and people would launch out of these cars that this wasn't an issue before. Um, and they, they were literally going to stop, like, like make it illegal and not have cars anymore. And then finally this person came out and said, why don't we just take a piece of cloth and strap our bodies to our seats? And that solved this really horrible problem. And that's all she said. And then she walked away. And I realized she was just like telling me, no, my genetic engineering was like way too complicated. And like, it's just the most beautiful way to think about like, sometimes a simple solution is the best. Like, so sometimes like trying to think like, of something simple to, I don't know, accomplish your goals might actually be the best way to get there. So like, I was actually have like a post-it on my desk to this, to this day that says seatbelt. That's all it says is seatbelt. Just as a reminder, like, don't overcomplicate things. Um, but I also would say like other advice that I've gotten professionally, a lot of it I've just ignored. And I would just say like to, to listeners, like you kind of just have to follow your own gut. And sometimes you have like a gut instinct of what you want to do and what is the right path and you just got to do it. I've had some like really, really remarkable scientists tell me, you know, don't join this lab because it's a new PI for your PhD. And I was her first student and we had a lot of fun and found some really important things for pancreatic development. And um, it worked out really great. And then I had similar people tell me, don't, you know, go to a coastal school for your postdoc. And I came to Cleveland, Ohio, where there's fantastic science and it's, it's paid off. And like, sometimes you just know it's the right decision in your heart and you just have, have to ignore, even if it's like your most trusted mentor, just do what you feel is right for yourself. That's sage advice. And I, I would say you could combine those two pieces that, you know, simple is often better. Uh, but you kind of have to do it your own way, right? And I think part mm -hmm. of your mission as a scientist and mentor is to bring these kids in early, right? So they can make the mistakes, mm -hmm. understand the process, demystify it. Like you went to Hughes and you saw all these Nobel Prize winners. They're human beings. They have thoughts. They make mistakes. They have dumb ideas, right? But they have the <laughs> opportunity to flesh it out. And I think it's a great testament to your you know, uh, appreciation of that aspect of your career to get these kids in early, and, and to just expose them, allow them to make their own mistakes enough times, right? We gotta, we gotta make a lot of errors. We gotta take a lot of hits, get rejected a thousand times before we break through. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's great to have you on the show as a kind of a light uh, to, to look toward along those lines. And I would encourage everyone, you've heard a lot of applications. If you're in high school, apply to this Rise Up. If you're, you know, a postdoc, apply for the NYSA. Apply for the gray. 
And most of all, apply to be a student or postdoc in the Skabooka lab. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll have a lot of fun, um, definitely. A lot of fun and a lot of progress, a lot of innovation. We can't wait to see. We'll have you back on the show as soon as that lab opens up and we'll hear about your next story. Marissa, thank you so much again for joining us and sharing. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks, you guys, so much for listening to this episode. It was a great one. Four for four for organoids in the roundup. And then a nice talk about the link between my mind and my gut, which is troublesome. Until the next time, thank you guys so much for listening. We'll catch you again in a couple of weeks. Bye.